This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Friederike Ernst. So today we're speaking with Mike Pichiak. Mike Pichiak is the president of NASA. And uh, so we want to speak tonight because they're planning on taking cryptocurrency to the moon. <laughs> no, actually that's, so NASA in this case is the North American Securities Administrations Association. And so it's, uh, it's a regulatory body, or actually it's more of a, an association of regulatory bodies that includes every state level and provincial level financial regulator in the U.S. and Canada, as well as Mexico, and the federal level uh, securities regulators. So it's an organization that not a lot of people have heard about, probably, but that uh, came to light in the crypto space about a year ago when they launched uh, Operation Crypto Sweep, which uh, sent cease and desist letters to over 200 ICOs that were deemed to be fraudulent. And so we want to speak with Mike. Uh, about you know about NASA as an organization because it's not w- very well known uh, in the space, but also to understand his position and the association's position with regards to regulation uh, in the crypto space. And I was actually quite impressed and pleasantly surprised to learn that at least this association has a, a pretty positive view of blockchain and ICO in general, and are really just trying to go after fraudulent projects. Mike is also the Commissioner of Financial Regulation in Vermont, and it seems a lot of good things come out of Vermont. So they recently pioneered um, the DAO LLC, the blockchain-based LLC, um, with a new legal framework, which we will also talk about. And of course, as Mike also mentions, Ben and Jerry's is also from Vermont. Yes, and so that's at least one reason to go there. Uh, <laughs> so you had an announcement uh, you wanted to mention that you're going to a conference soon. Oh, yes. I'm going to Consensus in uh, New York um, in May. So I'll be there May 12th to 16th. I have a talk on the 13th. Um, so find me if you want to talk to me. Great. Uh, I will not be there, but uh, have fun. So without further delay, here's our interview with Mike Pichak. Hi. So we're here today with Mike Pichak. Mike is the Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Financial Regulations and the president of the North American Securities Administrations Association. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, happy to participate in the podcast. Great. So tell us a bit about your background. So you've been in financial regulation for some time as the commissioner of uh, the Vermont DFR. Sorry. What, what, where did you come from and how did you get involved in this uh, position? Yeah, sure. So happy to, to talk about that. I um I grew up in Vermont and, uh, you know, always had wanted, uh, had an interest in going uh, to law school and being uh, interested uh, in a legal career. Uh, also, uh, had always been interested in policy, uh, policy development, uh, politics, things of, of that nature. Um, so I did go to, uh, to law school and I did uh, start off my legal career working uh, in a major law firm in, in New York City where I was focusing on a lot of uh, uh, merger and acquisition deals. Uh, a lot of uh, international companies uh, that um, were, uh, you know, doing business transactions. Um, and the thing that first got me uh, interested in securities laws was not really, you know, the work that we were doing in connection with those M&A transactions, those, the, the work that we were doing uh, in connection with the SEC with those transactions. It was really um, uh, non-equity crowdfunding. So it was the Kickstarters of the world, the Indiegogos of the world. I remember being in New York City and um, hearing about some really interesting a Kickstarter crowdfunding campaigns and some really interesting Indiegogo um, crowdfunding campaigns and, and was looking into some of the products and into some of the companies. And I thought to myself, boy, this would be really fun to invest in these products. Um, this is sort of, I, I, as at the time, I understood that to be sort of the whole concept that you can uh, invest in these, pro- these projects by with a little dollar amount and then, you know, you could see them grow. And, uh, and lo and behold, I sort of all of a sudden became aware of the um, very uh, protective in some ways a uh, framework that exists around uh, smaller upstart offerings, localized offerings, uh, basically the crowdfunding offerings. So 
I got really interested in, you know, how do you, what is this framework? Why does it exist? Uh, and then uh, is it appropriate for the way that uh, businesses want to raise capital in the 21st century, particularly uh, businesses that would be prime uh, for localized crowdfunding or national or international crowdfunding? Uh, so I got really interested in those issues. Um, uh, I came back to Vermont because uh, the deputy commissioner position opened up of our securities division. Um, and I uh, certainly saw an opportunity to come back and work on those issues, which I did. Uh, we created a, a couple of different uh, crowdfunding exemptions for Vermont. Uh, we also worked with the SEC to make um, their regulations more modern in terms of uh, being able to offer products over the Internet um, within a single state uh, so that you um, were in, in compliance with the, the federal securities laws. Uh, and Vermont has always had this tradition of uh, localized investing, sort of crowdsourced investing. Ben & Jerry's, which is one of our uh, most well-known brands, uh, started from a Vermont-only offering. Uh, they raised uh, $750,000 uh, from about uh, 3,000 Vermonters uh, in the uh, early 80s. Um, and that allowed them to expand uh, their production facility. That allowed them to widen their distribution network. Uh, and the next year, they did a national uh, IPO. Uh, so that was really a, a success story that started with the ability of neighbors, of consumers, uh, of products, uh, of friends and family uh, being able to legally invest small amounts of money, uh, but legally invest into a startup business. So that was really what in intrigued me, that crowdfunding movement um, uh, to get involved in, in regulation. Uh, then about three years ago, I became the commissioner of our department. Uh, so we, um, as a department, oversee the securities industry, uh, the banking industry. And then also the insurance industry as well, uh, and a subset of insurance called captive insurance, uh, which uh, Vermont is actually a, an international leader in. Um, we have about uh, half of the Fortune 100 companies have a captive insurance company based here in Vermont. Uh, 18 of the Dow Jones Industrial 30 companies have a captive based here in Vermont. Uh, so we have a, a rich tradition um, generally in insurance, but specifically in, in captive insurance world. Um, and many of those captive insurance companies are experimenting uh, with various uh, blockchain projects. So um, that uh, got me interested more, uh, certainly in uh, the space that we're going to talk about today. Um, but so did the concept of, of an ICO. I mean, the ICO sort of, to me, is sort of an outshoot uh, of this crowdfunding movement that uh, in some ways that you could um, have a project, have an idea. Uh, and instead of doing it through, um, you know, the, the federal crowdfunding regime that was created, uh, you know, you could get the same type of bang for your buck by doing an ICO uh, and raising a tremendous amount of money, as you certainly know, some of these ICOs have achieved uh, in an extraordinarily short period of time. So in some ways, I became interested in this space also as a, a cap as a capital formation tool uh, and how um, this might be a new way uh, for for tech businesses, for startup businesses to raise uh, considerable money, uh, again, in a period of time that's uh, much less than a traditional roadshow through an IPO uh, or other other means that currently exist. Well, that's super interesting, and we'll uh, we'll get into the potential of uh, blockchain-based uh, projects and fundraising um, a little bit later. Um, you're also the president of NASA, uh, which is not what it sounds like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about NASA, what it stands for, and uh, uh, what it does? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and, you know, everybody has their own funny story. But mine was uh, I came and worked here at, at the department for, you know, my first week. And and we were talking about crowdfunding regulations. And somebody um, in the meeting said, well, you know, so and so um, used to work at NASA. And this is his position on the regulation. And I thought to myself, wow, like, I guess that's impressive that this guy used to work for, uh, you know, the space agency. What does it have to do with financial services uh, regulation? Uh, so uh, then uh, I had my introduction to our NASA, um, the North American Securities Administrators Association. Uh, so NASA is um, a membership association. It's made up of all of the jurisdictions in the United States. Uh, so the 50 states plus the District of Columbia, uh, plus some of the United States territories. Um, Puerto Rico is a member. Uh, but then we also have members from Canada, uh, the provinces and territories in Canada, uh, and Mexico as well. So all in all, there are 67 uh, jurisdiction members uh, that make up uh, the NASA community. Uh, we are celebrating as an organization our 100th anniversary this year uh, in 2019. Uh, so we're founded 100 years ago uh, in Kansas. And the reason that 
NASA was founded. The reason that state securities regulators were founded uh, was that during that time period, uh, there was a lot of fraud occurring uh, in the central part of the country, uh, in America's heartland, in Kansas and Iowa uh, and other parts of, um, of the of mid-Atlantic uh, and mid-Western states. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, people were coming from the East Coast and, and, uh, and, and providing great uh, uh, investment promises and great expectations of returns to these farmers that really didn't know any better. Um, and really, they were just fly by night uh, fraudsters taking people's hard earned money, uh, taking their life savings uh, and then vanishing uh, without a trace. Uh, so um, NASA and state securities regulators uh, were founded on the concept uh, that people that are going to sell uh, investments in our jurisdiction, in our state, uh, should be registered with a central regulatory body, uh, in this case, the Department of Financial Regulation, um, and that uh, their product should be vetted by some means to determine its legitimacy. And then also that the individual selling the product, so the brokers, the dealers, the investment advisors, uh, should similarly have impeccable backgrounds in terms of um, being honest people, uh, having sufficient education and knowledge uh, to be able to um, guide uh, these people in their investments. Uh, you know, handling your life savings, handling your investments is a really obviously critical, a critically important item to many uh, families, uh, all families really, but many uh, people in the United States and worldwide. It means uh, how much you're going to be able to uh, spend um, on your next home or how uh, much you're going to be able to help your children go to college, uh, what your retirement is going to be like uh, once you uh, leave the professional workforce. So all of these things are really determined uh, on uh, how smart you are in investing throughout your career. Uh, so certainly we want people that are honest and knowledgeable uh, selling good products to our constituents uh, and providing them good investment advice. So at the heart of it, that's why state securities regulators um, were founded. We were founded decades before the SEC, and NASA was founded decades before the SEC. Uh, we were the uh, quintessential cops on the beat, if you will, uh, within all of these local jurisdictions, uh, trying to ensure uh, that the capital markets uh, were uh, clean uh, and safe uh, so that the American economy uh, could succeed. Uh, so now, today, uh, I mentioned uh, NASA is a membership association. So the main purpose that NASA serves now uh, is really getting uh, these various jurisdictions uh, in three different countries uh, to come together and work together on model policy, model law, model regulation. Uh, so we have a, a deliberative process where uh, various project groups, we have a, a corporate finance project group, an enforcement project group, a broker dealer project group, an investment advisor project group, uh, and then also um, an investor education uh, group. Uh, and they all work on policy to try to improve uh, the marketplace, to try to keep up with technological changes, uh, try to keep up uh, with the change uh, in these various financial services industries. Uh, and then we pass uh, these models uh, within NASA as a body. Um, and then uh, each individual jurisdiction goes back uh, to its legislature or its um, legislative body uh, and implements these model rules so that we have uniformity among 67 different jurisdictions acting uh, on separate cases in a separate way, but that we have a uniform sort of playbook that we're all working from. Okay, so most of these regulatory bodies are actually quite independent in their local jurisdictions, but rely on sort of the guidance that comes from these working groups to you know, implement policy locally. Is that yeah, that's exactly yeah, that's exactly right. Um, we uh, try to have a lot of internal discussion at NASA among this policy. Uh, we try to get consensus so that you know, if there is disagreement, it gets ironed out at that level uh, so that people do go back and implement these regulations. Uh, we also hear from industry and consumer stakeholders during our process so that we get the full, uh, the full um, understanding of, of the pros and the cons of various policies. Uh, but at the end of the day, NASA as an association, it does have, um, it does have a corporate office. It does have staff. It does um, provide a lot of services to our members. Uh, but our members are the autonomous, independent, uh, regulatory authorities that at the end of the day uh, have to decide to take an enforcement action, have to decide to implement a policy or pass a, a model regulation. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, each jurisdiction like Vermont uh, maintains its regulatory authority. How many people work at NASA? 
So it's an interesting question. The, the NASA corporate office uh, has uh, about 20, 25 people that work uh, in the corporate office, but um, we're really driven by our membership. Uh, so we have about 400 people that are on uh, volunteer committees uh, in uh, those various categories that I mentioned. Uh, so all in all, um, you know, there's about four to 500 uh, state securities regulators, staff people, and corporate office members uh, that are working to um, staff the NASA organization, uh, staff the resources that we're providing back to our jurisdictions, uh, and also helping us uh, develop um, the model regulations that I mentioned and expand our message out uh, beyond state securities regulators uh, so that we um, uh, you know, are a known quantity within the financial services world. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft had you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS, and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. So I actually learned about NASA when someone mentioned that, uh, that you guys were involved in the takedown of, uh, of Jordan Belfort, you know, the infamous Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, of, sort of briefly, about that? And and I think this relates to you know the your 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 enforcement power and you know, what what kind of uh, law enforcement bodies you rely on in order to coordinate you know uh, countrywide or like continent wide in this case uh, action. So yeah, the 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 Jordan Belfort, the Stratton Oakmont case is a, is a great example of NASA uh, working together in a multi state enforcement action. Uh, to um, bring an enforcement action that doesn't just impact one jurisdiction or two jurisdictions, but really uh, the national uh, scope in terms of its impact. Uh, so NASA has a, a multi-enforcement mechanism where all of the states together will act against an individual or an entity. And the Stratton Oakmont example is certainly one of those where we were, we were able to get a national settlement uh, using NASA as uh, the mechanism to do that. Um, certainly in the 1990s and 2000s, beyond Stratton Oakmont uh, and the very publicized Wolf of Wall Street, uh, there were certainly other uh, cases related to um, auction rate securities, uh, the Prudential settlement. Uh, some of these settlements uh, totaled in the billions of dollars. I mean, these were really large, uh, impactful uh, settlements that NASA was able, able to achieve. Uh, and in many ways, um, although uh, we have, uh, you know, we regulate uh, the industry in different ways, um, certainly when we're acting together through enforcement means, uh, in some ways is when we as state regulators are the strongest in doing some of our best work, uh, so protecting the investment uh, public. Uh, but again, at the same time, uh, all enforcement actions certainly uh, are derived for going after bad actors. Uh, but by going after those bad actors, we are also helping the integrity of our capital market system so that you and I and, and everybody uh, that's listening has confidence that they can invest money in the United States in a business, uh, and they are not. They might be investing in a business that will go um, defunct. They might um, make wrong business decisions. They might go bankrupt. But that it's not a business that's going to steal their money. That is an important um, element of a free market, uh, you know, a capitalist system that we have uh, in the United States. That there is some confidence. Uh, that uh, there's legitimacy uh, in the capital markets and within the businesses and the advisory firms that work within that space. Basically, NASA launched Operation Crypto Sweep, 
um, about a year ago, so between May and August 2018, um, NASA investigated 200 crypto projects, um, mostly for securities violations, um, and it's resulted in 50 plus enforcement actions. It was in the news somewhat last year. Um, ca can you tell us um, the story and uh, maybe give us an update? Yeah, no, be happy to. So, you know, the Operation Crypto Sweep was, again, taken out of the sort of NASA multi-jurisdictional playbook. Uh, it basically tried, instead of each individual state trying to bring enforcement actions against these cryptocurrency ICOs that were operating uh, within many jurisdictions, if not all jurisdictions, um, there was a collective effort to work together uh, to leverage each other's staffs and resources um, so that... Uh, for example, Vermont and New Hampshire weren't working on an investigation against the same ICO, the same cryptocurrency, uh, that we would decide which state was going to handle which matter. Um, and then uh, in that way, uh, we could look at a much broader spectrum of, of cases uh, and bring a much broader uh, number of enforcement cases rather than us not coordinating with each other. Uh, so again, this was a classic example of state regulators uh, working well together, working through this multi-jurisdictional um, uh, process. Uh, to um, get some results. So the main reason that, again, we saw this as an opportunity for state regulators and an opportunity to protect the marketplace was because so much of the ICO activity, I mean, you see a report from 2017 that suggests, you know, 70, 80 percent of the activity uh, had some fraudulent uh, element to it or was in some way illegitimate. Either the project just, you know, wasn't going anywhere uh, they didn't invest any resources in developing what they said they were going to develop. So with that being the backdrop, we thought we could play an important role in helping this space innovate, helping the space grow and, and develop by taking out the clearly bad actors that uh, were promising, you know, 100 percent investment return, 70 uh, percent investment return. Uh, you know, they were promising uh, that you would, uh, you know, get all your money, uh, you know, guaranteed, no risk. Uh, so these are the classic red flags and fraud that we see, whether it's a uh, cryptocurrency or whether it's someone coming to your grandmother's door and knocking and trying to sell her something. Uh, these are the, the hallmarks of fraud that, um, you know, again, are timeless in some way, regardless of the mechanism that's being used uh, to try to, to perpetrate it. Um, and again, that was in the backdrop of the big run up uh, in the price of uh, Bitcoin uh, through 2017. Uh, so at the end of 2017, when everyone, you know, was sort of in this manic phase about Bitcoin and buying and, and was it too late and what other ICOs are out there that I can buy, you know, there was a lot of fever around, let's get in on the next best thing. And there may very well be uh, the next best thing out there. And there very, very well may be good um, investments to be made or good opportunities to be had. Uh, but there are also, unfortunately, a lot of criminals, a lot of fraudsters and bad actors that were trying to take advantage of that mania, trying to take advantage of that hype uh, and simply um, trying to steal people's money. They weren't trying to do any legitimate projects. Uh, so in that way, uh, we really, I think, uh, as, a, as an organization, have played a helpful role uh, in weeding out some of the bad actors and, 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 uh, and trying to um, clarify uh, you know, those that are, are attempting to comply with the securities laws or, in fact, are complying with the securities laws. Okay. So I, I think... When a lot of people see um, regulatory bodies uh, or government agencies come out with, you know, either advisories on crypto projects or, in this case, you know, actual, um, you know, enforcement, I think the sentiment for a lot of people is, you know, here we go, another regulatory body you know, trying to assert power over over our our innovation our innovative space where we're just trying to innovate and do all kinds of interesting things. But it sounds like that wasn't really the case. The case was like, okay, here are some actual frauds. Like, and, I mean, we in the crypto space, I think we're amongst the first to be able to notice these. And sp specifically, like having a podcast, we were just bombarded with requests for people to come on the show. And like, we see these projects, like, this is clearly a fraud. Like, this is a Ponzi scheme. Or well, be, uh, feel free to refer those to us if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> sure, uh, I've got an inbox full of them. I don't know if there are any of them are still around, but yeah. So like, we see these things, and you know, I think in our eyes, it's quite obvious which ones are frauds and which ones are the most more reputable projects. Now, whether or not those are, those are uh, uh, they're complying with securities regulations is another story. But it sounds in this case, NASA was actually just doing what it's meant to do is protect investors 
and go after those that were actually frauds. That's exactly right. I mean, I as a regulator, and I think every regulator, whether they're at the federal level, at the state level, in insurance and banking, I mean, you really have two core uh, balancing principles as part of your mission. Uh, one is to protect investors or protect consumers. Uh, and the other is to ensure uh, that the capital markets um, or that the, um, the products that are out there, uh, that there is um, innovation occurring, uh, that there is efficiency in those marketplaces, uh, that there is an innovation in those marketplaces, that those markets are robust uh, and strong. Um, because if you really are focusing too much on the investor protection element, uh, it's really at the end of the day to the detriment of those investors because they're going to have more expensive products. They're going to have less innovation. They're going to have less choice. They're going to have less um, available to them. Uh, and then if you focus too much on the other side of that prong, if you focus too much on the innovation and focus too much on uh, on the uh, on the robustness of the marketplace, uh, then you're going to see um, bad actors come in. You're going to see fraudulent deals come in. Um, and those bad apples are going to uh, destroy the trust and um, the legitimacy of that capital market. So you really need to have those two elements uh, in mind and you really need to balance them and have a good perspective um, to allow innovation to occur. Uh, but at the same time, uh, think about what new innovation means to investors and how uh, do they need to be uh, protected. Um, I know the, you know the SEC has set up a, a cyber unit uh, within its agency. Uh, and I think NASA and the SEC have a very similar mindset. Uh, we see basically three buckets of, of companies, three buckets of ICOs, if you will. Um, there's those that are just the outright frauds. Uh, there are those that are trying to comply with securities laws, or maybe they're not even aware that there are such a thing as securities laws, but their white papers are trying to be transparent. They're trying to provide uh, detail uh, about um, their project. They have a legitimate project. Um, and then there's a final bucket, which, um, you know, is doing the belt and suspenders and following all of the regulations and all of the requirements. Um, and our focus, you know, our interest is in going after that first bucket, the bad actors, uh, and helping that middle bucket understand the securities laws and helping them comply uh, with uh, the regime uh, so that they can offer their product. Uh, and then just monitoring that last bucket. Uh, so we really don't have an interest in trying to stifle innovation by going after you know, these people in the middle that maybe are forgetting to uh, file a, a notice filing or forgetting, you know, um, in some cases, they might even be doing something that is more severe, but again, unintentionally. Uh, so it's not uh, an attempt to play gotcha regulation, um, but it's really trying to educate and help them get into compliance. I think that's an important role that we play. How are these projects brought to your attention? So do, do you join as really scammy telegram groups? or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, some, I'll tell you some of the obvious ones, because I, I think probably I'm not giving away any, any uh, state secrets by saying this. But, you know, there, there's certainly, um, you know, you can monitor uh, Reddit, you can monitor uh, Craigslist, you can monitor various, um, uh, you know, sites out there that are going to be uh, places where Vermonters and other citizens are going and, and trying to find more information out about um, the newest ICO, the newest cryptocurrency. Uh, so those are really effective ways of just beating back some of the nonsense that's out there. Uh, so that's sort of certainly a number one. Uh, at the end of the day, we really uh, do um, get a lot of our cases through complaints. So uh, investors that are harmed will be complaining uh, to us. Unfortunately, that's more of a... Um, a reactive method because at that point that means someone has been out there selling something for quite a period of time uh, the investor has been dragged along for some period of time and then finally they realize that they're probably involved in a fraud or they're not getting their money back and that could be three or four years after they made the investment um right so we've in, been in the case of the ico busts i mean you know if these projects were raising money and you guys went after them i mean this this, this crypto sweep uh occurred just around the end of it, you must have been monitoring quite a few projects and like actively monitoring the space to figure out which of yes. these projects were fraudulent. Did you have any like clear criteria that you were looking for here? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. And, and we so in this space, we were trying to be more proactive and monitoring and, and, and taking action quickly. Uh, so really, uh, you know, first and foremost, we tried to understand if the company uh, was registered anywhere, if they had had any conversations with securities regulators. That was just sort of a baseline um, a question that wasn't something that decided if we did an enforcement action. Uh, but then we were looking for, again, these hallmarks of fraud. 
Were there um, uh, an expe- Was there a promise that uh, this was risk free? Was there a promise that this was a guarantee? Um, how far along in developing the project were they? Was it really just sort of a pie in the sky idea? Uh, or was it something that could actually be operationalized um, through the investments that they were seeking? Uh, again, did they promise outsized returns? So were they saying you can get 50, 60, 70 percent return on your investment? Um, these are things we would be looking for uh, if we were just in uh, the traditional sort of Ponzi scheme um, you know, uh, type of fraud. Uh, and we saw the same exact things here in the ICO space, people that were over promising uh, and were unable to deliver. And we can detect, you know, we can pretty easily sort of understand um, those red flags. And then we would go in and, and subpoena the companies uh, for information. And then based on that, we would decide, you know, do we need to bring an enforcement action uh, or not? Uh, at a, you know, we mentioned that we had 200 investigations. You know, I know we had investigations here in, in Vermont. Um, and we would, uh, you know, if you'd send a subpoena, the company very well might just all of a sudden fold up shop. Uh, but in other cases, we had to uh, go out and um, bring an enforcement action, uh, which we did uh, uh, from a number of different states, uh, Texas being one of the big leaders, North Carolina as well, uh, against some of the, the actors out there that um, either disputed uh, that they were not acting uh, inappropriately or fraudulently, uh, or against some of the people that um, you know, we thought were the more egregious uh, situations that we had to take action against. And how many enforcement actions has this resulted? And how many do you, I mean, basically, this was one big sweep. But I assume you also have you also do this on an ongoing basis. Um, so um, how, how much of your time do you actually spend with uh, crypto scams? And um, can you put some numbers on how many uh, you bring enforcement actions against? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Uh, yeah, how many so people we... are in jail? Actually? <laughs> 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 Well, the jail takes some more time, but there are some of our, so our membership has various authorities. Some of them do have criminal jurisdiction um, and, uh, you know, they very well uh, could bring criminal charges. But because we were proactive, um, in all honesty, uh, for example, the cases that we brought in Vermont did not yet have any investors in Vermont. Uh, so by acting proactively, we believe we prevented a lot of um, people from losing their money, uh, where if we had sat back. Uh, you know, uh, these more of the scammy type ICOs uh, would have um, unfortunately raised some money and then either failed to deliver or outright left with with the, with the proceeds. Uh, but to answer your question, you know, we had about 200 investigations during the first six months of Operation Crypto Sweep, 50 enforcement actions. Uh, that number, I think, is now almost double in the enforcement actions. I think it's it's closer to 100. Um, so that's a pretty um, significant number when you think about um, the type of, you know, the type of uh, due diligence, diligence that we have to do in bringing in enforcement action uh, and the fact that um, this Operation Crypto Sweep, although, um, you know, certainly um, uh, a point in time effort, it continues. And that has only been uh, about a year and a half or 18 months where it's really been in earnest uh, in terms of investigating these matters. So that's a pretty significant amount of cases to have brought. Uh, in that period of time. So moving on now to the broader topic of regulation in the blockchain and crypto space, you know, first, what do you see as the main innovation that blockchain and more specifically, I think you know, we should focus the conversation, at least at this part, uh, on permissionless networks, you know, public networks like Ethereum, Bitcoin and others. What's the main innovation that you see here with regards to securities law and how do you think it sort of changes the focus or changes how one should look at these regulations in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you've hit the, the key issue as it relates to um, financial services or global finance or, or even um, uh, international uh, business um, is how uh, do permissionless blockchains uh, enable um How do how do you how do companies operationalize uh, concepts on a permissionless blockchain? What are the projects that uh, are able uh, to meet um, uh, problems that these financial service companies or these international firms are facing? Um, and to date, in all honesty, uh, you know there have been hurdles that companies have not quite been able to get over um, in the financial services space. I think there are a lot of discussions and a lot of um, concerns around the concept of privacy. Uh, so in a, in a public, um, fully transparent, uh, permiss permissionless blockchain, 
uh, how does a, a bank or an insurance company, uh, a securities firm, uh, do the transactions, um, make the uh, accounting that it needs to make, the, 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 and, and at the same time, uh, protect um, the identity of a transaction, uh, protect the identity potentially of the individuals or any of the other uh, sensitive business information um, that needs to be uh, protected. Um, and in some ways, it could even, you know, it could just be the fact that the transaction is happening and that people could, um, from that, determine who the who the various uh, participants are and then take advantage of that uh, some way in, in the public um, uh, investment arena. Uh, so I think that that concept is something that uh, people are still struggling with. You certainly see private blockchains be utilized in financial transactions. Um, just today, I was reading about a French lender uh, that was issuing bonds uh, via uh, a blockchain. At first, there was some discussion that this was going to be a public uh, blockchain, uh, but then they had to clarify that it was really uh, the French lender issuing the bonds uh, to a subsidiary of itself. So it was a, a private blockchain transaction. Uh, so we continue to try to see examples of it in this in this public space, but um, again, they're they're struggling a little bit with with those with that first question and a couple of more questions that I'll, I'll mention. Um, but uh, just a note on that transaction I just mentioned. The thing that's that's pretty interesting to me is that um, the credit rating agency uh, that rated the bonds uh, when they um, took into account that uh, the blo a blockchain was used, uh, they gave that as a credit positive uh, element. Um, and, and basically what that means is they looked favorably on that. And the reason they looked favorably is they said it provided greater transparency for the transaction. So, you know, that cuts a little bit against the privacy element that the credit, the credit rating agency saw that as a benefit. Um, and then they also said that it was going to cut down uh, on mistakes. It was going to cut down uh, on, um, you know, human error, uh, that it was going to make it uh, more, um, uh, you know, more accountable and better from that perspective. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, development, certainly, um, when uh, thinking about, uh, you know, other players that are operating in this space that businesses need to take account uh, for, like regulators, credit agencies, uh, banks, uh, and the like. Uh, there's also been a lot of uh, discussion in uh, this permissionless blockchain uh, space, certainly uh, in the insurance community, among interoperability. So how will various public blockchains connect with each other and interact with each other. And there's some companies out there um, that are trying to provide a solution to this. And that's some that's one area where, and I know you've had guests recently on your podcast that have talked about this. Um, so that's one area where I'm certainly personally interested in how does that develop. Uh, I know uh, industry is interested in how that develops because I think that uh, probably solves a lot of the questions that, that people have about what does this look like in five years. Um, there's one company uh, I know that's trying to make an attempt at this uh, called Corda Enterprises, and they have made plays in the financial services space and in the insurance space. Um, they have one interesting um, insurance uh, play that uh, Ernst & Young um, and a company called uh, Guard Life uh, are attempting, uh, and it's a very discreet type of insurance, uh, but it's for marine vessels, so four big ships. Um, and this same point that I'm going to make can apply to any insurance transaction for the most part, uh, but they see the process as being inefficient because there is uh, the thing that they are insuring, uh, the boat, uh, there is the owner of the boat, uh, there is an insurance broker that's brokering the insurance, and then there is an insurance company that's providing the insurance, uh, and then there is a reinsurance broker. Uh, that's working with the reinsurance company, and then there's the reinsurance company providing the reinsurance. Maybe there's even another layer uh, on top of that, depending on how far they go on the reinsurance side. Uh, so they view that as being an inefficient streamline, not a streamline, but an inefficient process. Uh, and also, when you have a process like that, similar uh, to the bond example I gave, uh, it it invites inefficiency and invite invites human error. Um, so Ernst and Young uh, has created uh, with a uh, Cordia, um, a blockchain solution uh, that would allow a new vessel that comes into somebody's possession to be entered into uh, the, this uh, distributed ledger uh, program uh, and immediately be underwritten uh, for the criteria that they have plugged in uh, for that contract to have been immediately issued uh, and then for the reinsurance underwriting to occur almost simultaneously and for that, um, uh, for that policy also to be issued. Uh, 
so that's one you know example of trying to um, allow for a, um, a permissionless uh, public blockchain to be incorporated uh, into um, financial services. Uh, but again, uh, that interoperability is a, is a, remains a question. And then the other thing I hear, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this as well, uh, but I was just recently at an insurance panel uh, with the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, um, and there was discussion about the scalability of permissionless or public um, uh, blockchains uh, and whether uh, the speed of transactions that need to happen in financial services uh, will be able to be achieved uh, through um, a permissionless blockchain. Uh, they were uh, talking about how their current databases and, and privateless blockchain potentially uh, could uh, complete thousands of transactions uh, in the same amount of time uh, that a public blockchain might only uh, be able to complete a dozen or so of those transactions. So I've heard a lot of discussion around the scalability issue. How much can, um, how quickly can these transactions be verified and implemented? Um, and then the flip side of that too is what is the cost of that, both in terms of dollars and energy uh, consumption as well. Um, Somebody mentioned that uh, I think it's the um, country of Iceland that spends more money uh, on um, mining Bitcoin uh, than it does uh, on all energy consumption through uh, their entire households and the entire country, which was kind of an interesting uh, fact. I don't know if that's been verified or not, uh, but I think it does bring a point that, um, you know, how do you account for that um, scalability in terms of the speed and then also in terms of uh, the secondary impact of energy consumption? Uh, and uh, and the cost of that, both in terms of financial cost and also in terms of environmental cost. You make very interesting points. Um, so I, th I think there's a couple of things here that um, I'd like to talk about for sure. Um, so one being the interoperability, the other um, being scaling, um, and uh, the third being the energy consumption that uh, comes from the proof of work uh, mining that's currently going on in uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and also uh, many other chains. Um, the one uh, thing that I want to talk about first is uh, privacy. So um, you talked about privacy in the very beginning. I mean, while it's completely true that uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin uh, in terms of privacy are terrible because everything is out there, there are now technologies that preserve privacy, right? So I don't know whether you know about um, zero knowledge proof or, um, or um, things like uh, Zcash, um, where um, you you can have shielded transactions where uh, it's no longer public knowledge um, who does what. Um, how do you feel about these? Yeah, and I, I, I'm not familiar with those particular uh, companies, but I am familiar with some that I think are aligning uh, the same type of concept. I think the one I mentioned, Corda Enterprises, is working uh, on similar um, items where uh, basically uh, if you're doing a deal, uh, two parties – uh, are doing a deal uh, that a competitor third party uh, wouldn't have the information about your deal stored on their um, uh, network uh, if they were operating in a distributed a public distributed uh, ledger network uh, so that they are protecting uh, the information in that way and I think that's a, a good advancement because um, although again it's not that it's not that the business world or financial service world doesn't want to be transparent uh, but that there is certainly uh, information, sensitive information, business information uh, that uh, individuals want to keep private. Um, certainly, you see this with uh, SEC filings. I mean, uh, people need to make confidential filings with the SEC all the time uh, because they don't want um, that information to become public before uh, it needs to be public or at the appropriate time. Um, and uh, they don't want people to uh, you know, manipulate the stock market because if they've gotten non-public information. Uh, so certainly those are, I think, are good advancements uh, on a global perspective and able to protect um, uh, the sensitivity of transactions and the sensitivity uh, of um, this information. Uh, and then the next question, of course, on the privacy piece is, is personal privacy um, and personal information. And, you know, certainly, um, you know, on the one hand, in all honesty, uh, you know, the current ways that uh, corporate entities and and financial services firms are protecting uh, folks' identity is is lacking. I mean, there have been a number of cybersecurity breaches that uh, have been quite uh, well known uh, throughout the last three or four or five years. Uh, companies certainly are doing everything they can do. I think most of them, at least the good the good actors, 
uh, and protecting the privacy and the confidentiality of individuals' information. But you can't, in the current structure, you can't um, prevent it. You're just trying to uh, mitigate it, minimize it, and then respond to it when it happens. So, uh, you know, if a distributed ledger technology does uh, have um, some hope in, in securing our networks uh, to an even greater degree, uh, that equally would be uh, a good development. Uh, but I just, I personally continue to wait and see what will come about that on both of those points in terms of individual privacy and on the um, sensitivity or the privacy, if you will, uh, of, uh, of, trans of transactions generally. I would like to come back to a point you made in the very beginning um, about um, crowdfunding, um, because I also think that is a tremendous benefit to blockchain technology. And you said that you, you became interested in crowdfunding um, in, in, in the times of Indiegogo and uh, GoFundMe and Kickstarter. And I would like to add and maybe discuss that um, while in, in traditional crowdfunding uh, campaigns, you actually fund a product, right? So basically you buy, say, um, a super co uh, cool, I don't know, hoodie or something uh, that, you that you really want because uh, it, it has... 20 functionalities, I whatever. Think the, I think the one that was like the best was that one that was the cooler that was maybe also a radio or something or a stereo. <laughs> yes, so, so, so some, something like that. And you pay, say, $70 um, for the promise that um, if they manage to build them, um, uh, they, they will ship you one first for these $70. But they, they only sell you the product. They don't sell you a share in the company. So basically, if this company um, becomes fantastically su successful, You, you as someone who actually funded the development do not benefit from that. And um, I think we have seen this time and time again. For instance, in the Oculus Rift case, I don't know whether you're, or you, you're familiar with this. So yeah. basically people, people um, uh, crowdfunded this um, VR headset um, and uh, got a fairly lacking uh, prototype. Uh, the company was sold for several billion dollars to, I think, Facebook. Um, Uh, the the founder cashed out, um, and support for the things that had already been delivered was uh, was uh, phased out. So the people who actually who actually kickstarted this in the best sense, um, they, they they didn't actually have any part in the success um, that uh, this this company had in the end. And with um, with um, ICOs in the best case, um, this you 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 become a stakeholder in that company. Uh, and you um, you uh, benefit from the future successes. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's right. I mean, that's what I, that's why I see this connection between crowdfunding uh, and the ICO space and how it can be, um, you know, in, in many ways, you know, there, there's been some amount of crowdfunding in the equity crowdfunding space at the federal level, uh, but I don't think it's been as great as many uh, of us or the SEC or, or those in that space may have anticipated. Um, and it's interesting because at that same time when federal crowdfunding finally uh, had the rules finalized and it was allowed, this concept of the initial coin offering or the initial token offering uh, came in at the same time. And all of a sudden you had businesses that could raise capital, not just from the United States, but internationally um, in, a, in a way that, again, uh, was in, in some ways more efficient. Um, in some ways they uh, were not doing it in compliance with regulations, which made it more efficient. Uh, but that they were able to do it more quickly um, and uh, and more efficiently in terms of the mechanism of raising the money. Uh, so it is quite a fascinating and interesting concept. And I do agree with you, um, you know, in terms of the uh, non-equity crowdfunding, the Oculus Rift case, I remember I talk about it quite frequently because I think if I remember right, the headsets were three or four hundred dollars, something in that range. Um, and if that three or four hundred dollars had instead been an equity investment, You know, they would have gotten, you know, 67 to $70,000 of return on that investment. Uh, so that would be, you know, quite substantial. Uh, and instead, like I say, you know, many people were waiting by the mailbox for their check to come in, uh, not appreciating that they had bought the product and not invested in the company. Um, so uh, I do think there is great value in giving uh, people um normal people and people like us, I mean, people that are not working at invest, that are not investment banks, that are not pension funds, that are not uh, hedge funds, that are not uh, extraordinarily wealthy individuals that get uh, the private deals that are going on and are the first ones to get in on the IPOs that are going on uh, within, um, uh, you know, the New York Stock Exchange and others. Uh, but to give everyday, you know, uh, investing public 
uh, an opportunity uh, to get in on some of these uh, opportunities at the very earliest stages. That is, I think, a, a tremendous upside uh, to uh, crowdfunding and then also uh, to uh, ICOs. So I mentioned earlier that balance between, you know, invest, you know, between facilitating capital and facilitating investment uh, and then also investor protection. And the rub is that although these are exciting uh, opportunities uh, for the businesses and for the investors that get in with the business at the ground floor, putting aside the fraud, putting aside any of bad actors, uh, you know, startup companies, you know, for every Oculus Rift, there is probably uh, 10 to 20 companies that have, uh, you know, fallen on their face and, and the investment went nowhere. Uh, so, um, you know, it's up to us a little bit to, to teach the traditional uh, concepts of financial literacy to understand uh, that you need to um, do some due diligence on the business. You need to not put more money than you can put in that business, uh, assuming that you lose everything in terms of your investment. You don't put more than you can afford to lose. Uh, make sure you have a diversified uh, portfolio. Um, so certainly, um, you know, in terms of advances and, and what you're talking about, uh, when you get to a place where you're starting to have a fund that is investing in various ICOs that you can achieve that immediate uh, diversification um, or, or, or an ETF. I know there's a number of ETFs that are trying to get uh, licensed or regulated on um, the New York Stock Exchange. When you get to that next level, uh, that also will um, you know, be a positive uh, development, both for businesses and for uh, investor protection. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but to, to come back on Frederica's point, uh, when when you look at this this Oculus Rift story, it looks a lot more. It, it has a lot more of the same characteristics as as a fraud in the security space, where like there was a promise that it would deliver this product, but in the end, the product was never delivered, and you know people were disappointed. Maybe so. Of course, you know the amount invested and the wasn't as much as say you would maybe put in an ICO, and the 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 outcome expectation wasn't maybe the same. But in a sense, people were promised something, and in the end, they didn't receive it. And I don't know if crowdfunding regulation actually you know, takes that into account or not. So if just in a general consumer sense, if a business is promising you something and then they don't deliver, um, every state attorney general you know, would have the ability to bring a consumer action against that company. And some attorneys generals did, in fact, bring uh, actions against businesses on Kickstarter and other uh, non-equity platforms that uh, did not fail to, that failed to deliver. Because just to your point, um, just because it's a $300 product versus a $300 investment, if they took that money making false promises, they should be uh, certainly held accountable. I'd like to move on to another point, which is the transnational aspect of blockchain. So uh, blockchain projects and the teams themselves are often transnational. So a lot of teams working in this space you know, have remote workers and the projects themselves are uh, targeted and, and can potentially be attractive to people from all around the world. But re securities regulation itself is is a very national or state level uh, type of activity. How do you circle that peg or square that circle uh, and 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 make those two fit together in a way that you know you can you know have innovation and I think to some extent you know uh, have this these these organizations that are truly global and also have regulation that protects investors. Yeah, it, it's a it's a great question. It's, um, it's both a practical question and a theoretical question almost in one. And um, I have a couple of different ways that I want to answer it. I first want to give a very specific example um, as it relates to Operation Crypto Sweep um, and some of the enforcement actions that state securities regulators uh, are bringing. Um, so to your point that, you know, uh, both the good and the bad, but focusing on the bad, um, ICOs are, are international. Um, you know, when we are bringing an action and it turns out that the individuals are located not just outside of our jurisdiction, meaning our state or our providence in Canada, but they're outside of our country. They're over in a country or a, a territory that maybe we've never even heard of on the map and we have to look it up. And how do you uh, enforce a subpoena against that person or that entity uh, that's far uh, outside of our jurisdiction? Even the SEC has challenges with that. Even the Department of Justice have challenges with that. Uh, in terms of enforcing subpoenas and then enforcing legal actions uh, against uh, individuals that are uh, operating outside uh, of the United States. So that's a really practical um, issue that we're now confronting uh, in a way uh, that really in some ways we've never confronted before because there certainly was the internet 
and they're certainly uh, you know made communication effortless around the globe. Uh, but you hadn't seen um, on such a large scale uh, the ability to make investments in companies that really were uh, not they weren't corporate international multinational companies that were trading on the New York Stock Exchange but operating everywhere in the world. Um, these were companies that were coming out of ICOs and, and cryptocurrencies that were coming out of nowhere um, and blockchain uh, projects coming out of nowhere that are uh, able to operate anywhere in the world uh, and in many ways uh, do. Uh, so we are confronting that real sort of jurisdictional uh, limitation. To your point, just about you know how do you develop a policy that around that worldwide um, infrastructure? Certainly, incumbent companies uh, struggle with that. I mean, to be frank, I mean uh, companies have to deal with um, uh, the United States and, and its securities laws, the United States and its privacy laws, the European Union and its new regime relating to privacy and its securities laws and. And uh, and certainly in Asia, uh, their, their their laws and and uh, can be even uh, considerably different, and even the approaches that these countries are taking. So that's something that international companies certainly have to struggle with, and they they have the resources and and the ability to to navigate that. But a lot of startup companies, a lot of uh, new projects, might struggle pretty um, severely with that, and it could certainly stifle uh, and prevent uh, innovation. Um, so I think. So, so what's what's the, the what's solution? the solution? Yeah. Here, do you think? Yeah. So there's one just one historical note. Um, you know, in the United States, uh, when somebody did a national IPO, um, nowadays you go uh, to the SEC and they uh, register your offering and then you offer it nationally. Um, it used to be uh, that you actually had to bring that offering to each of the individual states in the United States and get it approved. Uh, and if it wasn't approved in Vermont, you could do your IPO in the other 49 states, but not in Vermont. Um, so you basically had 51 regulators, if you take the 50 states and the SEC, approving an IPO. Um, and then in, in 2000, or sorry, in 1996, uh, much to the chagrin of state regulators, but um, they federal Congress passed something called uh, NISMIA. It was basically a National Improve the, the Markets Act. Um, and the intent was to take the state securities regulators out of that decision and put that authority with the SEC because it was a national offering. It wasn't localized. It, it did have an impact on a local jurisdiction, uh, but it was a much broader national uh, scope in terms of um, its impact. And a national regulator uh, should be the one with primary authority over that. So my point in telling you that historical anecdote is, you know, could you see a situation many years down the road uh, where an international, multinational um, securities offering is being regulated by some body that, you know, is overseen by uh, multiple uh, member uh, country nation members. Uh, and uh, maybe that's a solution, uh, you know, if you're trying to think again on the theoretical side. Um, but certainly first steps to get there. Uh, there's certainly two concrete first steps to get there, I think. One is that individual jurisdictions have to wrestle with this and wrestle with the guidance that should be provided. Um, so the SEC recently put out a framework uh, for ICOs. Uh, that was a helpful uh, first step. Um, but then uh, on the national level and international level, the SEC, NASA, other regulators uh, internationally uh, need to start working uh, and communicating with each other um, in a uh, more concrete way. Uh, we certainly have organizations that uh, have uh, facilitated that interaction in the past. Um, but more so now than ever is the need for national regulators to interact with each other uh, because it's no longer uh, a United States issue. It's no longer a Canadian issue. It's a worldwide issue, whether you're talking about blockchain development, ICOs, uh, cybersecurity uh, issues. Uh, these are really um, matters that are impacting a business uh, anywhere in the globe uh, by anybody anywhere in the globe. So we really you know, need to start facilitating better communication. So those are sort of two uh, concrete steps. Better formalize your guidance uh, within your jurisdiction uh, and then work to um, harmonize that guidance with other international uh, regulatory uh, bodies. Despite the fact that in principle, these steps that are being developed by uh, blockchain companies uh, would be usable all over the globe, um, many companies have actually chosen to geoblock uh, the U.S., uh, in order to not get in a uh, sticky situation with um, U.S. securities laws. So U.S. securities laws are seen as um, 
much more restrictive in in many terms uh, uh, compared to to um, other jurisdictions. Um, do you think that in itself stifles innovation? Yeah, it certainly can certainly can uh, stifle uh, innovation, and and I do have just a couple of of reactions to that. First uh, and foremost is you know I've I, even as a re state regulator, uh, I've been surprised by how open the SEC is to having conversations with um, cryptocurrency, ICO, blockchain uh, products that imp that impact uh, you know the securities marketplace or implement or um, uh, you know they have an involvement in the securities marketplace. They have been um, very open and interested. Uh, they have a fintech uh, group at the SEC uh, that has had uh, individual meetings with companies that has provided them uh, guidance. Um, both in terms of a guidance that um, is individualized and also for uh, companies uh, generally that are operating in that space. State securities regulators similarly uh, are certainly open uh, to hearing uh, new ideas and new projects. Uh, so certainly my first piece of advice to those uh, companies is to engage with um, the regulators here in the United States to make sure that you fully understand the avenues that are available to you to get Uh, either registered or to get an exemption from registration. They're basically at the very broadest levels, uh, three different categories that an, an investment can fall into. Uh, it can be a registered offering, which means you go through the full registration process at the SEC or at the state level, uh, or there can be an exemption from registration. Uh, so, um, you know, the SEC and the states have found that certain transactions don't need to be fully regulated. Uh, by a, a body here in the United States, or the joke is that the rest of the third category are all illegal transactions. And, um, you know, I, I think it just illustrates the point that that folks should think about how do you get into compliance either from uh, either from registering. And I do agree that registration process um, is largely for companies that are more mature, that have a, a more um, uh, sophisticated, you know, sort of a footprint and offering. Uh, and it costs a lot of money. It costs uh, money to get professionals, uh, attorneys, uh, accountants, investment bankers. Uh, so that is certainly an opportunity that it does not present itself to everybody, particularly startup companies. And then if it's not uh, through a registration process, what are the exemptions that are available uh, to this community? Uh, and largely, this circles back a little bit to a point we had earlier, um, largely those exemptions that are available are private exemptions, meaning that you can sell Uh, to wealthy individuals, to accredited investors, uh, but largely Main Street investors are shut off uh, from uh, that uh, opportunity. Uh, so uh, there have been discussions at the SEC uh, recently, and we've been engaged with them on this, to change the definition of an accredited investor, uh, to broaden it so that different categories of people come into that uh, definition. Um, and certainly that's something on a personal level that I've been uh, supportive of. Um, particularly younger people, they might not have developed the um, assets to become a, 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 an accredited investor. They might not have the income yet to become an accredited investor, but they have sufficient knowledge to make them an, a sophisticated investor. And certainly the SEC should think about that. And, and can you allow people to make investments in these private offerings if they have sufficient um, knowledge and expertise? Um, and I would suggest that you should look uh, To allowing them to do that. Um, but at the same time, you should try to protect and mitigate the amount of money uh, that could be lost. So maybe you put an investment cap on those type of individuals that they could only invest, you know, $25,000 a year, $50,000 a year, whatever it might be. Uh, so to answer your point, you know, the, the U.S. laws can be complex as they exist now. Um, it's hard to get a token offering into the hands of a Main Street investor. Um, but it is possible, and there are other exemptions that people are trying out uh, in an effort to do that. Um, so I do encourage um, any projects to sit down uh, with a, a regulator to try to get more information, to try to work with them, to see how you could structure your deal uh, to make that plausible. Uh, but at the same time, there's certainly more work uh, that needs to happen on our side of the equation, on our side of the ledger as regulators, uh, to think about how do you, what's the appropriate balance uh, to allow uh, folks to get into this marketplace as investors uh, while still uh, making sure uh, they have a, a level uh, of protection um, and uh, don't 
you know, lose their entire retirement or life savings uh, in a, an investment that goes south. Yeah, I, I think that's a decent approach to uh, to look at investors more on the on the basis of you know sophisticated and non sophisticated rather than you know, wealthy or non wealthy, uh, because you know in in today's day and age, and I think probably this wasn't the case before. I mean, obviously, it wasn't the case before, and maybe this is why these laws were implemented. Today, people have an access to an abundance, an abundance of resources that allow them to become highly knowledgeable and gain a sophisticated amount of knowledge about you know, things like ICOs, things like um, you know, investing uh, in these types of projects that didn't happen, didn't you know, exist before. And, uh, and so I think that changes the landscape. Um, and I think that the European approach to this, so Frederick and I both being in Europe, is a is uh, you know a, a nuanced approach to that where you know when you open an investment bank account for ex- for instance you know the you know the, you 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 get asked a lot of questions about your level of sophistication and then of course uh, any investment product has to come with a prospectus and like all these guidelines and um, you know what the investment entails etc. So since we're coming you know towards the end of our show here. Uh, I'd like to talk about Vermont more yeah, specifically, sure. and you know, Vermont has positioned itself as a, a place that would like to attract blockchain companies. One interesting thing that I learned right before this uh, podcast is that Vermont has or is in the process of implementing a blockchain-based LLC uh-huh. that would allow you know, DAOs to have some sort of a corporate status. Uh, tell us a bit more about what's going on in Vermont and uh, about this BB LLC. Yeah, happy to talk about the blockchain uh, LLC, and and uh, that was one uh, we had a bill last session in our legislature. This was one element of that bill that I uh, really uh, did get uh, interested in and excited in uh, because you know, uh, oftentimes, particularly with regulators but legislators, you know, we need to try to see some of the um, practical applications of some of these laws or even some of these blockchain projects. We want to see. You know, how, how does this uh, get employed? How does it make people's lives better? How does it save money? Um, and this blockchain LLC was one where I did see it solving a uh, quite uh, legitimate problem or confusion in the corporate world, uh, which is, you know, when you have all of these various players that are operating in a, a token offering or in a cryptocurrency, you know, what is the legal relationship between uh, these participants? You know, are they... Um, is someone that's helping mine a uh, public blockchain? Are they an independent contractor? Are they an employee? Uh, are they a shareholder? Are they, you know, whatever? Um, and I think you could make theoretical and legal arguments as to what they might be or what they might not be. Uh, but what the blockchain um, LLC was attempting to do was give a legal entity and a legal framework uh, for the companies, uh, for the projects rather, uh, to decide what those legal relationships would be for themselves. So there's certain parameters that they have to fall uh, within, uh, like any uh, corporate entity, uh, but really it provides much greater level of flexibility uh, for them to legally define the relationships of all of the various players um, in a public uh, blockchain. Uh, so again, this was a little bit theoretical, but again, trying to make it more operational and more practical um, we have had, I think, um, just about a half dozen uh, to maybe just close to 10 uh, blockchain LLCs that have filed uh, with the Secretary of State's office here in Vermont uh, over the last uh, six months. So there has been some interest. Um, we will at the you know appropriate time, I think it's a, a year out, take a stock of who has been uh, availing themselves of this new entity. How is it working in practice? Um, and, uh, and then how uh, might it need to be improved upon uh, or um, what other you know features do we need to think about adding to it but at the heart of it um, again the concept was uh, to allow the projects to define these legal relationships which otherwise are unique and undefined and and a- ambiguous uh, so that they are providing themselves some level of certainty as they operate very cool and uh, absolutely needed in this space um, Vermont also um, announced a pilot project in captive insurance. Um, for our listenership, could you first uh, explain very briefly what captive insurance is and um, talk a little bit about this project? Yes, happy to. And, and, and yeah, captive insurance, what is it, is a question that we get off, off asked pretty often. Uh, so uh, 
the 30 second summary is that it's a formalized mechanism of self insuring. Uh, so you, uh, all of us uh, on this podcast, if we needed auto insurance or homeowners insurance, we would go to one of the big insurance companies uh, and purchase that policy from an independent third party. Uh, large corporate entities, however, uh, might not uh, find it to be the most cost efficient to go to, uh, you know, AIG or uh, tr- uh, some other large uh, Lloyd's of London travelers, some other large insurance companies uh, to purchase their insurance. Instead, uh, they might decide to form their own insurance company internal to their company. Uh, and that's essentially what a captive insurance company is. Uh, they can better control their risk. They can better manage the risk. Uh, they can have immediate access to the reinsurance markets. Uh, so at the end of the day, it ends up costing them less money uh, to, to have a formalized self-insured insurance company within their corporate structure rather than buying the insurance from a third party insurance company. So as I mentioned, Vermont, you know, we are uh, really the gold standard when it comes to captive insurance. We have about 600 of these uh, companies uh, in our state. Uh, They uh, write about $30 billion of premium uh, through these 600 companies in Vermont. So a very large uh, marketplace. And the reason why we thought um, this pilot project with the Secretary of State uh, relating uh, to blockchain uh, technology was was useful in this space uh, is because those 600 companies belong to really large international companies that are familiar with distributed ledger technology, familiar with its upsides, trying their own pilot programs within their companies. So they have a, a level of interest in um, participating in, in a similar pilot. Uh, and then from our perspective, you know, what it really accomplishes. And again, I'll get back to this concept that, you know, I really am trying to appreciate the academic and theoretical nature of a lot of the discussion that uh, I've had uh, with many people in this space, but trying to bring it back to um, a practical and operational uh, concept and idea. And for me, this is a really, really small first step uh, that Vermont can take as it relates to the way that government operates. Um, to better understand the technology, uh, and not just myself, but our staff here at the department, the staff at the Secretary of State's office here in Vermont, uh, that that on a granular level, uh, individual staff members here in state government can get more familiar with the technology, uh, that companies can file. Basically, what the pilot would do is allow new captive insurance companies to file with us um, their corporate registration documents, um, their annual filings, and the like uh, through a distributed ledger um, rather than the traditional paper or online filing. Uh, and again, I don't think we're going to get a, a tremendous amount of great efficiencies. I don't think this is going to be the greatest you know, thing that any state government or, or the industry has ever done. But what it's really going to do on a practical level is, again, get us more familiar with the technology and then allow us to identify areas where we can scale up. So the Secretary of State handles thousands and thousands of filings. Uh, is there ways where they can uh, use a private or public blockchain in a way that makes their operation more efficient. From a regulatory standpoint, uh, are there ways uh, that we uh, can uh, use the technology to make uh, the way that we take in information or the way that we regulate the marketplace? Can we make it more um, efficient? Can we make it uh, more transparent? Uh, Can we make it more accurate? Uh, Those are all of the answers that we're hoping to get uh, out of this pilot project. Uh, so um, we're very excited about it. You know, we're one of the first, if not the first, insurance departments uh, in the country to uh, actually step out uh, and try to take on uh, their own uh, distributed ledger pilot program. So again, we're very, um, we're very excited about the prospect uh, of uh, making an incremental step uh, and then seeing where that will take us. Great. That's uh, that's really fascinating. Uh, and so finally, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your your goals uh, as president of the Na- of NASA, you know, what do you hope to achieve here? And you know, you've been with the organization now for I think over just over six months. Yeah, been, yeah, that's exactly right. We're halfway through uh, my presidential term. Okay, so okay, so presidential terms are, are quite short then. You know, what do you what do you hope to ach- have have achieved during this uh, this short time? Yeah, sh- sure. So it, you're absolutely right. I mean, you can't uh, achieve much during a single year. So you, really what you have to do is um, make sure that uh, you start early, you lay the groundwork for any initiatives that you have early, um, and that you um, develop initiatives that those that are going to follow you are going to be interested uh, in continuing on. 
Uh, so personally, what I uh, hope to achieve, I'm the first uh, millennial president of NASA. Uh, we wanted to have more focus on millennial issues as it relates to um, investing uh, and as it relates to uh, retirement savings and, and the like. Uh, so basically, as you're probably familiar with, millennials are saddled with student loan debt. They're delaying uh, decisions that um, you know are the traditional hallmarks of adulthood, like uh, purchasing homes, uh, buy, having children, uh, saving for retirement. Uh, and it really, in some ways, is, is causing uh, many different social impacts than, than people are, I think, even appreciating or realizing. Certainly, states like Vermont, you're seeing that millennials have to leave the state to get jobs that are higher paying to pay off that student loan debt. Uh, that's having a direct and immediate impact on our economy. Um, and then you're seeing, uh, again, uh, the young, uh, young folks that are just starting out or folks that are in the middle part or early part of their career, you know, having nothing saved for retirement. And that's going to be a considerable issue uh, when they don't have time on their side anymore and they're getting closer to retirement age. So highlighting those types of issues is one of the things I really wanted to accomplish as NASA president, um, get that converse, conversation started uh, and to get uh, policymakers in Congress at the SEC and at the states uh, more focused uh, on, uh, on millennial issues as it relates to financial uh, services. Great. Well, that's very encouraging. Um, well, thank you for joining us on our podcast today and uh, good luck for the rest of your term. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. I, I really uh, do appreciate it. And uh, I do congratulate you as well for, uh, for sticking with uh, this podcast. I understand you guys have been doing it now for five years and uh, every week. That's, uh, that uh, is something that's really difficult to keep up with and, and to do. So I applaud you for your perseverance and, uh, and uh, focus on these issues that, that are really important issues. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, it it, uh, it has been five years and uh, it, it's not always easy, but we try to keep <laughs> up. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.